What do we mean when we call God creator? I think we mean a lot. There's a lot in that word that I want to spend the next few days unpacking. When Christians summarize the faith in the creeds, the Nicene Creed says, I believe one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. The Nicene Creed expands that a bit. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things, visible and invisible. That is a sweeping, that is a sweeping claim. Not only is God the creator of what we know and can see and appreciate, but whatever we can't know and can't see and appreciate, God is the creator of that too. And with that claim, we have left whatever the domain of science could ever be, whatever the domain of the natural sciences is, it stops at what's knowable. It stops at what's visible and measurable. But Christians aren't done. God made all things visible and invisible. I'm going to give you this way of understanding the word. To call God creator or to call this universe creation is to name a set of relationships. Not just one relationship, but a set of complex relationships. And naming God creator shows that the universe is the work of our trustworthy God. How do we know? Well, look at the context of the claim. We believe in one God, or we trust in one God. The Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things, visible and invisible. We don't just call it the universe. We don't just call it existence. That doesn't name the relationship that it has with its maker. Affirming creation, affirming that the universe is creation, is not an initiative on our part. It's a response. God has taken the initiative by making in the first place and then by revealing the making. And that has led to this response of trust, embodied in scripture, but carried forward generation after generation by those who confess God as creator. We aren't just saying God created the universe when we say we trust in God, creator of the universe. We're saying more. Uh, theology and philosophy have spent a lot of energy trying to uh, allegedly prove the existence of God. And you may have run across so-called proofs of God's existence that are especially popular in medieval philosophy, but which carry forward to the present day. Um, proofs such as the um, argument from the fact that things in the universe are good and bad, and that for things to be good or bad requires a standard of goodness by which they're measured. Either there is or isn't such a standard. If there is a standard, God is that standard. If there isn't such a standard, then there is no good and evil, and there's no use for the language. Since we, learn, since we use the language and use it truly and fruitfully, that means that God exists. All right, that's one of five or six proofs that's advanced in, in um, the Middle Ages. The Enlightenment uh, saw some devastating critiques of these so-called proofs. That doesn't prove that God exists. Um, and insofar as, it, insofar as people think that these arguments for God's existence validate logically that God must be, I think those critiques are right. I mean, I think the Enlightenment and even critics before the Enlightenment, show that just because we can imagine good or evil or use the language doesn't mean that there is one single all-encompassing standard and that that standard is God. I think they're right about that. 
Um, another proof is that we know that the universe is a, an effect with a cause, and the, those causes are effects from prior causes, which are effects of prior causes, and on back, right? Um, how did you get here? You could, you could draw out a chain of causation that brought you here and now as who you are. Um, well, that chain of causation can't last forever. That, con that can't go back infinitely. It must, it must start somewhere. There must be a cause that isn't itself an effect of some prior cause. There must be an uncaused cause. Allegedly, that, that proves that God exists because there must be such an uncaused cause. And that uncaused cause is God. Well, Stephen Hawking doesn't think that that is, a, is an appropriate or a, a normative way of understanding the origin of the universe. There might be uncaused causes. In quantum mechanics, things happen for no reason. No apparent reason, anyway. So, does it really disprove God's existence, or does it really prove God's existence? Here's what I want to, um, to set before you here. And it's a way of, of still uh, appreciating these so-called proofs. They don't logically validate that the God of Israel exists. They do, however, um, articulate the relationships that we have with the God who does exist. All right? These proofs aren't airtight deductions. These proofs are ways of working out the relationship that display its character. And there's a word for working out the texture of a relationship and thus displaying its character. Proving. When you prove yourself. When you prove yourself worthy. What you do is you demonstrate. You manifest who you are in a way that makes it more visible. All right? That's not what philosophers mean by the, by the word proof in that technical sense. But in the ordinary sense and in the sense of trusting response, actually it still works pretty well. If someone says, where did God come from? The right Christian answer is, I don't think you understand what we mean when we say God. The God who shows himself in Jesus Christ doesn't come from somewhere else. That's not who we mean. That's not who we're talking about. All right? That doesn't demand that that's the only rational way to think of it. It does, however, explain ourselves, explain what we mean, over against distorted way, uh, ways of, of uh, misunderstanding God. A couple more points in this introduction. The word God can be used generically. It, it, in America, gets used in all kinds of different ways, with all kinds of different meanings, depending on who's speaking it. Christians mean something specific when we mean that God is creator. We don't mean a God is the creator. We mean the God of Jesus Christ is our creator. We mean the God that lives and acts in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, in the making and unmaking and remaking of Israel, in the life of the church that continues to this present day and beyond, is the one responsible for the universe, for all things. All right? And to further unpack that, the New Testament in particular already wants to express our relationship with our Creator through the language of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, in 1 Corinthians 8, Paul says, yeah, there are many gods and many lords. Yeah, there's an emperor. We need to worship, you know, he wants us to worship him. There's uh, all these things in temples that that people are pointing to and asking us to respect those. Yeah, there are many gods and many lords, but for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things. 
and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things. Already, very early on, Christians want to say, when we speak of God the Creator, we are speaking of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father creates through the Son and for the Son, in or by the Holy Spirit. And where we're going for the rest of this whole lecture is that it's, it's, it's oversimplifying to think of this as one relationship. I mean, I have a set of relationships with you, and we've barely gotten to know each other. Right? I'm a fellow citizen of the nation state. Uh, I'm a fellow resident of Santa Barbara. I'm a fellow human being. I'm also your professor. I'm your brother, or at least for many of you. Um, well, our relationships with God that we mean, that we call creation, are many. Complex and coherent and ordered set of relationships. Those combine to yield, uh, to yield faith or trust, as Christians use the words. Over against other ways of understanding ourselves and understanding our cause or our source or whatever less personal term you want to use. Um, some of which don't seem suitable for faith or trust. And uh, none of which mean exactly what Christians mean by those words.